we've already discussed how to find the area between the curve and the x-axis. That's just the definite integral. What we haven't talked about is how to find the area trapped between two curves. In other words, not between a curve and the x-axis, but between two curves. The idea is really pretty simple. It just says find the area between the curve and the x-axis for both of them and then subtract them. And that should give you the area between the two curves, which should make sense to you. And I'll show you a picture to make it more obvious. When we're looking at one like this, we're talking about finding the area between curves with respect to X. Now these can be found with respect to X or with respect to Y. Now, what do I mean by with respect to X and with respect to Y? I mean that your integration is done with respect to X or with respect to Y. So what we're talking about is the actual differential in the problem and the limits of integration being Y values instead of X values. So when you integrate with respect to X, and WRT is short for with respect to, you have X, and then over here we'll put integrate with respect to Y. When you integrate with respect to X, the differential is dx. And that is indicator that you are integrating with respect to x. When you integrate with respect to y, the differential is dy. Right. What else is different between the two? When you're integrating with respect to x, the integrand has the form, we'll make these bullet points, y equals stuff with x. And you're taking the stuff with x as the integrand. So you have an expression, you had a function, and it was solved for y or f of x, and you use the expression on the other side for the integrand. When you integrate with respect to y, the integrand has a different form. You solve it for x so that you get stuff with y on the other side and you use that expression for the integrand. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, if you had f of x equal to x squared plus four, this is y equal x squared plus four. This would become the integrand if you were doing it with respect to x. However, if you were going to integrate this with respect to y, then you would have to solve for x. So you would have x equal y minus 4 under a radical, and you would have to choose whether you wanted the plus arm or the negative arm. And so you would have to choose positive or negative based on the graph. All right? And it's the square root of y minus 4, which would become the integrand. So this is a very fundamental difference between the two ideas. When you're integrating with respect to x, you leave it in the normal form, f of x equal a function or y equal the function, and you use the expression with x in it for the integrand. When you're integrating with respect to y, you have to take that equation, solve it for x. If it has plus or minus on it, then you have to look at the graph to determine whether it's the right arm, the positive one, or the left arm, the negative one, or it could be upper and lower. And then from there, you let that be the integrand, right? There's another difference between the two. The last difference between the two is the limits of integration. So 
So when we're looking at the limits of integration, they're different on the two sides. So how do, are they different? When you're integrating with respect to x, then you're going to go from the lower being the one on the left, x equal a, to the upper being the one on the right, x equal b. Now, what does that mean with left, right, upper, and lower? When you're talking about the definite integral, you have from A to B. So this A at the bottom here is the lower and the B at the top is the upper. Now, what does the left right mean? When you're integrating with respect to X, you're integrating from left to right. So the vertical line at X equal A is on the left and the vertical line at X equal B is on the right, All right? So that's what we mean by left to right. When you're integrating with respect to y, it changes. You still have a lower limit of integration, which is actually the lower of the two. And this is gonna be y equals c. And then you still have the upper and an upper, which I'll explain in just a second. And this goes to y equal d. So the integral would be from c to d. How does that apply? Well, you would look over here on the axis and you would be integrating from the lowest Y value of the region to the highest Y value of the region, from the low to the high or from the lower to the upper, okay? So when you're integrating with respect to X, you're moving from the left to the right. And when you're integrating with respect to y, you're moving from the bottom to the top or from the lower to the upper. So there are some very fundamental differences between the two. But what we're trying to get at is this area that you see here that's between the two curves. So this is where we have an, two curves and we've got this space in between them. Now the formula, what the formula is actually going to do is it's going to take the area between the upper curve and the x-axis using a definite integral like we've always done and find that total area between here and here. And then it's going to take the lower curve and repeat the process and find the area between the lower curve and the x-axis. And then it's gonna subtract the two when it subtracts the two, it subtracts off the area that they have in common, which is this lower region right here. And it leaves behind this amount of area here, which would be the area between the two curves. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So let's take a look now at another function. This is kind of a wild uh, fifth power function. And on this particular function, we have a fifth power and we have the graph of sine 15 sine of X over four. So we're looking for the area between these two curves between zero and four. So again, we've got uh, the fifth power looks like on top and we've got the sine function on the bottom. And we're looking for the area between the two curves. So again, what the formula is going to do is find the area between the upper curve and the x axis, which has more area, and we'll include this white region down here. And then it's going to find the area under the lower curve and the x axis, which is this white region. And it's going to subtract that from the other one, which will leave the area that's between the two curves. And that's how we find the area between two curves. You can, of course, divide the region into partitions and create rectangles. It's basically the same idea of the Riemann sum. So you create rectangles. The more rectangles you have, the more accurate it's going to be. Now, when we're looking at this, we call these strips. And when you're looking at the strip, I want you to notice what this width is right here on the strip. 
that width of the strip right there is actually dx. So you're taking strips from the left to the right because you're integrating with respect to x. And notice that you are extending them from x equal a to x equal b, the limits of integration. Also notice that the narrow end of the strip is the differential, which is dx. This will also be true when we integrate with respect to y, but in that case, the strips will not be vertical, they'll have to be horizontal. And then the change in y will be the narrow end of that strip. Notice also that the lower end of the strip down here along the bottom curve corresponds to the y value on the lower function, the one that is closer to the x-axis. This one up here is further away from the x-axis and the y value on the curve becomes the height of that strip. So in other words, the total height is the difference between f of x sub i and g of x sub i. Does everybody see that? This length right here is f of that value, which would normally go from the x-axis up, minus g of that value, which goes from the x-axis up. So the length of that strip is from here to here. So what we're doing is basically a Riemann sum again. We're going to take the height of the strip, which is f of x sub i minus g of x sub i, and we're going to multiply by the width of the strip, which is the differential dx. When we add the Riemann sum together, we can then take the limit as n goes to infinity, and that will let us find the area between the curves. So on this particular function, you can see it's the same function. I've pulled them apart into two pieces so that you can see the upper function and you can see the lower function separate from one another. And then you can see them together on the same graph over here. So when we're looking at them separately, notice that the area under this curve goes all the way down to the x-axis, and it is shaded from the top all the way to the bottom. The area between the curves is going to be that area that's shaded blue minus this area that's shaded green, so that the area between the curves turns out to be this yellow shaded area. Hard to get that all the way up in there. Which is that portion right there. It does not include this lower part. This lower part got subtracted off. So the area between the two curves just ends up being this yellow shaded region here. Now there are some applets for finding the area between two curves. There's one on Desmos and there's one on GeoGebra. I haven't played with the one on Desmos in a while, so let's take a look at it. So this is the one that I borrowed on, um, that I borrowed the picture from. So this is the one from Desmos. Let's go through and talk about the different pieces on the applet so you know how to use it f of x is one of the functions, usually the upper function. n equal 45 is how many boxes you want, how many strips you're taking for the Riemann sum. a is the vertical line on the left, that's your lower limit of integration. b is the vertical line on the right, that's the upper limit of integration. This is going to give you the value of that right there. So this is your delta x times f of all of that. And then scrolling down, you have to scroll down to find it down here. So this is the area basically under the curve for uh, f of x. And scrolling down, here in green, you'll find g of x, which is the lower curve. In our case, this is the one colored green. This is 15 sine of x over 4. 
this amount of area is the area under that curve. And then to find the area between the two curves, you have to subtract the two values. And I believe maybe it's not in here. I thought it was in here somewhere. You would have to subtract those two values and that would give you the area between the two curves, okay? So that's the Desmos applet and it does draw the as many boxes as you'd like, as many strips as you'd like. You can see them coming out more clearly there or you can let it go to infinity or towards 500, which is practically infinity as far as we're concerned. And you can see what the area turned out to be. It's, more, it's easier to see what's happening if you don't have that many boxes, somewhere between 20 and 40. The GeoGebra applet is a little bit different. In this case, it is very nice. I like this one because it has a very clear pattern for you to match at the top. So it says left end, which is X equal A, to the right end, which is X equal B. The curve that is on top, further away from the X axis, minus the curve that is on bottom, closer to the X axis, with the differential DX. If they're reversed, if you reverse top and bottom or you reverse left and right, you're gonna introduce a negative. So you'll get the right value, but the wrong sign. So be aware of that. Now on this particular one, <coughs> our lower curve is X squared and you can put the curves in right here into the box, lower curve, upper curve. And then it tells you what the area unit is. Now, what is it doing when it's computing the area unit? Notice that it is taking the upper curve and subtracting the lower curve. That's because we're taking that strip and we're finding the length of the strip, which is from G of X sub I up to a height of F of X sub I. So we subtract the two to get the length of that strip before we do the Riemann sum. So that's basically the formula f of x minus g of x. And you may say, well, but that's basically the same thing as just taking the integral. And I would say, yes, as a matter of fact, it is. So here's the formula right here. When you're looking at it, the formula to find the area between two curves is to integrate from a to b of f of x minus g of x. This is the formula. And again, this f of x minus g of x is giving you the length of the strip that goes between one curve to the other curve times the width of the strip, which is the differential dx. Then we add up all the area of all the rectangles. We take the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity, and that's the definition of the definite integral. But notice that you could just split this up into two integrals, couldn't you? And then this becomes the area between the curve f of x and the x-axis. And this is the area of the curve between the curve and the x-axis g. And then you're just subtracting the two. So in essence, it is pretty much what we've been doing um, all along. So coming down here for the rest of this particular one, the nice part about it is that it gives you the area and it shows you what the definite integral would look like if you enter the lower curve and the upper curve and you enter in your, your minimum values for X minimum and Y minimum, it will tell you what you've got. The other thing I like about it is it will let you drag this across from one side to the other so that you can see how much area you've got as you're dragging it across. So it's telling you that if you integrate from negative one up to 0.95, you're only gonna have 3.23 square units of area between them. If you go all the way to two, you'll get 4.5 square units of area between them. Now your X-Men out here, um, I'm trying to think, that sets the scale for the whole thing. So your X min, X max, Y min, Y max, that's the window that you see, all right? So the window that you have. 
all right? And it automatically knows how to find the area between the two. How would you find this location right here on the left where you need to start the integration? How did they know it needed to start at negative one? What did the formula find that told them to start at negative one and integrate to two? What's happening at those two points? That's just the interval for integration. Yeah, but why is it the interval for integration? I'm just going to tell you, find the area between the curves x squared and x plus 2. That's all I'm going to say. How do you come up with negative 1 to 2? It looks like that's where they intersect. Brittany is absolutely correct. She's got it in 1. That's where the two curves intersect. So where the two curves are crossing, that's where you're going to have the area trapped. So you're going to integrate from one intersection point to another intersection point. So you have to set the two equations equal to each other and solve. So you would have x squared equal x plus 2. Move the x plus 2 over to get x squared minus x minus 2. Factor it. You're going to get 2 and negative 1 is the solutions. Now, why this region? Can you see that as this gets shaded all the way across, that that is the region that is trapped between the two curves? It's like if you poured water in here, the water couldn't get out, right? It's completely contained between the two curves. That's usually what we're looking for. If A and B are not specified, then we're looking for a region where it's trapped. All right, and the water can't get out or the paint. This is one of the best ones that I've seen for doing area between two curves with respect to X. I looked and looked to find one with respect to Y. I could not find it. <laughs> so, uh, so unfortunately, and I don't have time to build one for you. So um, maybe I'll put that on my list of things to do over the summer is to build uh, an applet to do uh, integration with respect to Y. It's not as easy to do it with respect to Y on GeoGebra or uh, Desmos. Okay. When we get the area between the two curves, note that it will always be total area, not net area. In other words, it's always going to be strictly positive. It's finding the area between the curves, which it's going to consider to be strictly positive. So it will always be total area, not net area. Okay, let's start taking a look at some examples here. We have lots of examples to choose from. We probably will not work all of these in the interest of time. We'll kind of skip around and do every other one or something like that. But I want to do enough and set up enough that you get a feel for how to set up the area between curves so that it makes sense to you how the setup goes. Because once you get the setup, then the rest of it you can integrate pretty easily. But getting that initial integral written down is the difficult part. So getting the integral correct is probably 40 to 50% of the work. Does that make sense to everybody? That's the hard part or harder part, let me put it that way. It's not that the rest of it's easy. Can we find the area between the curves given by the square root of x and negative x over four? Why or why not? Okay, first thing to note is it did not specify from a equal a number to b equal a number. It just said in general, find the area between the curve square root of x and negative x over four. And here's our region right there. Now there's a problem with this. What's the problem? Is this area trapped? No. It's not no, trapped. it's not trapped. Do you see how it can keep going out this way? It keeps going and it gets wider and wider. So we cannot find the area between these curves as the problem is written. 
unless they gave us a definite place to stop from x equals zero to x equals 12. <clears throat> if they gave us that, we could do that. But the problem is this area never gets trapped. It's not between two curves like it was over here on this function where this region is completely contained between those two curves. It's not completely contained. And because of that, we cannot find the area between the two curves. It keeps going out here forever and ever. So if you wanna visualize, this area gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's just expanding, okay? <clears throat> Could we find the area between the curves given by the square root of x and negative x over four, the same functions, over the region from zero to six? Could we do, yes. When we say over the interval from zero to six, we mean that these are the things we're going to use as boundaries. Y equals the square root of x, y equals negative x over four, x equals zero and x equals six. When they tell you over a certain region or from A to B, they're telling you to use the vertical line at x equals zero, the left endpoint of the interval, and x equals six, the right endpoint of the interval. So that adds two more boundary markers that we can use in addition to negative x over four and the square root of x. Now, the next thing you need to do, and you need to be very careful about doing this in this section and the next section, or you will be looking at the wrong region. And I see this all the time. Students have the right idea and the right process, but they're doing it on the wrong region. So if someone tells you to go to Denver and do a job and you go to Colorado Springs and do the job, have you done the job? No because you're in the wrong place. You're supposed to be in Denver, all right? So what we wanna do now is I'm going to shrink this up a little bit and let's make it hot pink. Okay, I'm going to trace the curves that correspond to the boundary markers of this particular one. And I'm gonna look for a region that is completely surrounded and trapped by those hot pink curves you need to be able to find the region that will hold water or hold the paint in. So the square root of X is this guy right here, and it keeps going. Negative X over four is this guy right here, and he keeps going. X equals zero is another name for the Y axis. X equals six is this one right here. Now, where is the region that is completely contained by hot pink lines? It's the purple one. Does everybody see that? In this region, it can keep going up. In this region, it can keep going up and to the right. Here, it can go to the right. Here, it can go down and to the right. Here, it can go down. Here, it can go down and to the left. Here it can go up and to the left. They're not trapped. They're not contained. It's not like damming up water. We're trying to dam the water so the water can't get out. So we're looking for a region completely surrounded by hot pink lines. And, and it has to touch all four. That's the last bit. It has to touch all four. It barely touches x equals zero, but it does touch here at the origin. It touches the square root, it touches negative x over four, and it touches x equals six. Now, why am I emphasizing this as being so important? What we're gonna do in section 6.2, after we get the area between curves around, is we're gonna take this region right here, and we're gonna revolve it around an axis. Yeah. We're gonna take this region, we're gonna take a horizontal line or a vertical line, but probably horizontal, and we're gonna spin this around that line. And we're gonna produce a three-dimensional solid called a solid of revolution, and we're gonna find the volume of it. 
that's where we're headed. If you have the wrong area, you will have the wrong solid. So of course your volume will be wrong, okay? So looking at this one, we wanna set up the integral. Remember the formula going from x equal a on the left to x equal b on the right, the function further from the x-axis minus the function closer to the x-axis with the differential dx because we're integrating with respect to x. This means that we're actually drawing a bunch of little strips that are extending from one side to the other side. Does everybody see that? The first strip occurs at x equals zero. Because the first strip is at x equals zero, the lower limit of integration is zero. The last strip occurs at x equals six. So the upper limit of integration is x equals six. Then the strip extends from G to F. So to find the length of it, I take F of X minus G of X. So that's gonna give me the upper one, which is the square root minus the lower one, which is a negative X over four. And then I'm gonna multiply that by the width of each individual strip, which is DX. So it is a Riemann sum that we're doing, but it's a Riemann sum between curves instead of between the curve and the x-axis. Now all we have to do is integrate. Yeah, that's all. So basically getting this integral written down is the major first step. We have a double negative in our integral, so that will make it plus. And again, you can split it into two separate integrals, but that is not required. As you get more experience doing definite integrals, most students just leave it in the same integral and integrate each term. Remember that we integrate terms individually, not products. Factors are not individually integrated. So we're gonna rewrite this as the integral from zero to six of x to the one half plus x divided by four dx. Now we can apply the power rule to the first term, one half plus two halves, which gives us three halves, which means we'll multiply by the reciprocal two thirds, plus the one fourth is a constant, apply the power rule to x to get x squared, divide by two, and then evaluate between zero and six. So we're applying the fundamental theorem of calculus part two at this point. Prior to this, we were finding the antiderivative function, which was the indefinite integral part coming out of section 4.10. So now we have two thirds, x to the three halves, plus one eighth x squared between zero and six. You can either substitute them both into each term and do the subtraction within the term, or you can substitute six into both and then subtract substituting zero into both. It doesn't matter. You'll get the same solution either way. So I prefer to leave the two thirds out and do six to the three halves minus zero to the three halves plus one eighth times six squared minus zero squared, okay? Note that that is the same thing as doing two thirds, six to the three halves plus one eighth, six squared, minus the quantity two thirds zero to the three halves minus one eighth times zero. It will give me the same solution. So this is what I mean by the two ways of writing out these. You can do it either way. I do use both. It just depends on the problem. Sometimes I think this is simpler. Sometimes I think this is simpler. 
when I have coefficients, especially fractions, I tend to think this one is easier. And I go with this one, all right? So zero to any power other than zero is zero. So this gives me two thirds times six to the three halves, which is the square root of six cubed, plus one eighth of 36. Now I can simplify this a little bit. Six to the three halves is six square roots of six. So this gives me two thirds times six square root of six plus 36 and eight are both divisible by four. So that gives me nine halves, I believe. <coughs> Check my arithmetic. Six is divisible by three and gives me a two. So I'm getting four square roots of six plus nine halves. This is area. This is the amount of area that is between those two curves. This turns out to be roughly about 14.3 ish square units. All right, so we can go back up here and we can look at the graph and one square unit is this shape right here. All right, that's one square unit and the area between, I think, based on the scale, yes, um, kind of looks doesn't look like there's that much area. How much did I say? Maybe I typed that in wrong. Let's check. It looks like too much area. What is four square roots of six plus 4.5? Well, that's 14.3. Did I make a mistake anywhere? I'm not getting any, oh yeah, you did. <laughs> okay, all right. That must be 14.3, looks a little much, but okay, scale is everything. Okay, let's take a look at example three. This one I like because on this one, I don't have to tell you a closed interval to integrate over. The last one I had to because the region wasn't trapped by just the curves. But in this particular problem, the area between the curves x cubed and x is completely trapped. Not only that, but there are two separate regions. All right, so this one is important to take a look at because you can see there's a region trapped down here in green, and you can see there's a region trapped up here in purple. But it's more than that, it's more important than that. What is the difference between the green region and the purple region as far as which curve is on top? What happens? In one, uh, on the left side, on quadrant three, x cubed is above x, and then in quadrant one is the opposite way. Okay, so Juan volunteered that on the left side in the quadrant three, the green region, x cubed is on top of x, but in quadrant one, then we have x on top of x cubed. Now remember how your integral is set up, and I think this applet over here from GeoGebra does it extremely well, looking at this part right here, you integrate from the left side to the right side of the top curve, minus the bottom curve. But what's on top changes in our picture. So what does that tell you about how you're gonna to have to set up this integral to find the area between the curves? You have to split it into two different. Uh, Go ahead, Lindsay. You have to split it into two different uh, integrals from up until zero and then from zero onward. That's right, Lindsay's correct. We'll have to split it into two different integrals one from where they intersect in quadrant three to zero with the cubic minus the line, and then from zero to where they intersect in quadrant one with the line minus the cubic, all right? But, so wouldn't it equal zero if we're gonna subtract them? When they or... equal zero is uh, where they intersect right here in the center. 
we have to find where they intersect. That's the next thing we're going to have to yeah. do. So to yeah, find but, where they intersect, let's take them and set them equal to each other. So x cubed equals x. Now I've noticed on the last exam um, that some of you are making a mistake. You're making a, a very common algebra mistake with catastrophic results, okay? When you were looking for critical values, maybe it was the exam before last, when you're looking for critical values, you are making a catastrophic error. The catastrophic error is you were dividing by the variable. Do not divide by the variable unless there's absolutely no other way to do it. All right? So what we want to do is we want to move the x to the other side. We do not want to divide by x. If you divide by x, you lose the solution that x can be zero. That's what happens, all right? And I'll show you the mistake and show you what happened. So this is the correct way of doing it. You move the x to the left to get x cubed minus x. Then you factor out the common factor of x, and that leaves x squared minus one, which you factor. Then you're gonna set each factor to zero and solve, and you get x equals zero, negative one, and one. Does everybody see that? Now, this is the wrong way. Wrong way, do not do this. Do I have enough caveats on here that you know that this is something you should not do? Here, let's just put it in like red, okay? Don't do this. I see students who make the mistake of dividing by X. What did they lose when they divided by X? What solution is missing? The zero. All right, does that make sense? When you're looking for critical values, when you're looking for absolute maxima or minima or inflection points, this is catastrophic, right? You can't, you can't come back from this, all right? At least with finding the area between curves, you can graph the two curves. You can look at it and go, huh, something went wrong because they clearly intersected zero, right? So be careful, careful, careful. Do not divide by the variable. It's just, it's such a risky thing to do. It's like a level 10 risk. There are very rare occasions where we have to do it, but when we do it, it automatically means that X cannot be zero. And in this case, X can be zero. So we have three places, zero, negative one, and one. So we have to graph it to know which one is on top. So notice that as well. You're going to have to use a graphing utility to know which one's on top. So first we have the cubic over the line. So we're going to integrate from negative one to zero of the cubic minus the line dx plus, and then we're gonna integrate from zero to one of the line minus the cubic dx, all right? Upper minus lower. Okay, once we have the integral written down, then we can go ahead and integrate directly. These have similar integrands, but they are not the same. And we cannot put them together because of the opposite signs that they have. There's no way to connect the two, but they are very similar antiderivatives. So we have X to the fourth over four 
minus x squared over two between negative one and zero plus x squared over two minus x squared x to the fourth over four between zero and one. So they're almost identical, just opposite and sign to each other. All right. And I clearly didn't allow enough space here. All right. And then we want to substitute the values. In this case, I think it's just as good to plug in. I don't think it makes much difference. You can do it either way. I'm going to do one fourth, zero to the fourth minus negative one to the fourth minus one half times zero squared minus negative one squared. That's the first integral plus one half times one squared minus zero squared minus one fourth times zero squared over, I lost track of what I was doing. What am I doing? One. <laughs> Do you ever have moments where your brain just goes on a trajectory way away from you and you're like, whoa, come back here. I was thinking and it's not thinking anymore. Okay, yeah, so that just happened to me. All right, minus one four times one to the fourth. I need to just rewrite that. Uh, minus one fourth times one to the fourth minus zero to the fourth. There we go. Sometimes the brain just decides to go on vacation, <laughs> even though I'm not on vacation. Okay, especially this time of the semester, right? We all have those moments where the brain just decides to leave us. Okay, zero to any non-zero power is zero. So I get negative one to the fourth, which is a positive one. And then multiplied by the negative makes it a negative one. So this is a negative one fourth. Let's be very careful with our signs. This becomes a negative times a positive one. So it's a negative one times a negative one half, which makes it a plus one half. You guys check my arithmetic. Then I have another plus one half and another minus one fourth, which gives me the two minus one fourths give me a minus one half. So I'm getting one half. That's yeah, the final answer. Get, you got I that too? All right, good. Yeah. I feel a little better because, oh boy, my brain really did go on vacation. It was just blank. All right. Okay. So important thing to note about this one, even though we didn't have to have the closed region because the area itself was trapped between intersection points, it did change which one was on top. All right. Notice also that it is giving us the total area trapped between the two. I have area below the axis and area above the axis. If it were giving me net signed area, how much area do you think you would have? Zero. Zero. So it's not giving us net area, it's giving us total area between the two. All right, and so the total area is one half, which means this is probably one fourth below and one fourth above. And that's because it is origin symmetric. Both of these graphs are origin symmetric, all right? Okay. Um, let's take a look at this one. This one has trig involved in it. So we wanna take a look at the trig one. Find the area between the curves given by sine of X equal to F of X and sine of two X equal to G of X between zero and pi. So again, telling us to go from zero to pi is giving us that closed interval, those two vertical lines that are also going to be used. So we're gonna use sine x, sine of two x, x equals zero and x equal pi. So we've got x equals zero, which is otherwise known as the y-axis, excuse me, x equal pi, which is here, at about 3.14. And then we have sine of X, which is in black, which comes up here. 
And then we have sine of 2x, which repeats the pattern twice as fast. All right, so we have that. All right, so remember your trigonometry. We're looking for regions that touch all the shapes, and we're looking for regions that are completely enclosed. And we do have regions that are completely enclosed. That would be this region right here. And this region right here. Now I'm shading them different colors. Why would I shade them different colors? Why not the same color? There is a reason. Because we got to make two different integrals. Because we have to make two different integrals. Notice that which curve is on top changes. In the first yellow shaded region, we have the sine of 2x, which is on top, all right? The one in red, all right? So the sine of 2x is on top in the yellow shaded region. But in the purple shaded region, it's the black curve sine of x, which is on top. Right now we have to find where these two curves intersect. I know this is your favorite thing to do, right? This is, you love this trigonometry. So we're gonna have to find where they cross each other. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna look at where sine X is equal to sine of two X. All right. So when we're looking at where sine X and sine of two X intersect, we're basically saying that they have to have the same y value. So when are they gonna have the same y value? When would x and 2x end up giving you the same values? When would that happen? What is this point right here? It's actually written on the graph. You can see it on the graph. What is this point? Think about your graph of sine of x. Here's one half. One. One over the square root of two. That is um, pi over three. Then straight up is one. What about that guy? Over three. Yeah, pi over three and two pi over three. Remember that this is pi over three, the tall one, and two pi over three, which is twice as much, is the same triangle. Now, the others don't work because look at what it takes. Oh, I erased the whole thing. My bad. Okay. What it takes to get this one to come out here is five pi over six. So pi over six and five pi over six, those have the same y value, don't they? Yes, but they're not double each other, right? So it's not two times the other one. So when we're looking at this, the one we're looking for is pi over three. That's where they intersect, right? Pi over three and two pi over three. So they intersect at pi over three, and that's where we're gonna split the integral. So we're gonna integrate from zero to pi over three. And we're gonna be doing sine of two X minus sine of X DX plus the integral from pi over three to pi of sine of X minus sine of two X. Yeah. Now, sine of 2x, what are you going to need in order to integrate the sine of 2x? Double angle formula. Maybe. What do you need? I couldn't hear you. Double angle formula. Oh, double angle. I hadn't thought about that. Um, double angle. If we use the double angle formula, it would give us sine squared, and that would be hard to use. What do you see there? What is that 2x that's inside sine? 
inside outside you 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 excellent excellent one you're correct you substitution we have an inside function and an outside function we need you substitution so i'm going to write and i'm going to split this into multiple integrals so i can change the limits of integration so I'm going to have u equals 2x, du is equal to 2, abuse the notation and swing the dx around, solve for dx as du over 2, change the limits of integration for just that one, when x equals 0, u equals 2 times 0, which is 0, and when x equals pi over 3, u equals 2 times pi over 3, which is 2 pi over 3. All right. Now, I'm going to write that one over here. I'm actually going to write the ones that need u substitution in gray. So I have the integral now from 0 to 2 pi over 3 sine of u times du over 2. This is coming from here, all right? The second part of it, however, does not need u substitution. So the limits of integration stay zero to pi over three of negative sine of x dx plus the integral from pi over three to pi of sine of x dx, which does not need to have um does not need to have u substitution now it's very tempting because this upper limit of integration is pi over three and this lower one is pi over three to want to integrate from zero to pi but these are not the same integrand this is negative sine x and this is positive sine x they have to be identical and they're not so that don't that won't work what about this last one doesn't it need u substitution as well minus the integral and now we can use the same u which is also 2x and we can use the same dx but we have to change the limits of integration we have one for pi over three but we need one for when x is equal to pi then u is equal to 2 pi so this one is going to integrate from 2 pi over 3 to 2 pi of sine of u du over 2. So I used part of the same process that I went through for the first u substitution. I was able to use on the second u substitution because it had the same integrand with a negative sign. It had 2x inside of sine. So I was able to use the same u, the same du, the same dx, and the same when x is pi over three. But I did need one for when x is pi, so I had to figure that one out separately. Does everybody follow what I've done so far? Are there questions you'd like to ask? Okay. Now that we have that written down, and you can see why writing that down is at least half the credit. That's the more difficult part. Now we want to go ahead and integrate. So I have a one half, the integral of sine of u is negative cosine of u, evaluated between zero and two pi over three. That's for the first one. Minus, a negative cosine of u. So I have a double, oops, not u, x. Negative cosine of x, I have a double negative integrated between zero and pi over three. Plus a negative cosine of x integrated between pi over three and pi. And then I have the last u substitution minus a negative cosine of u between 2 pi over 3 and 2 pi. Make this a little larger. 
Oh, I think you missed the one half in the last one. I did miss a one half. Which one was it on? In the last one, in the gray one, last one. One half. Oh, yeah, that guy right mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now, the first thing I like to do, this is a personal choice. So you do not have to do what I do. You do what you do best. All right. Know yourself. I don't like the negatives running around. It is worth it to me to take the time to rewrite it and get rid of some of those negatives because I know that's where I'm going to make a careless mistake. So the first thing I'm going to do to take care of this negative right here is swap these limits of integration. So this is going to give me one half cosine of u between two pi over three and zero. That takes care of that negative. In the second term, I have a negative, but I've got another negative. So I have a double negative. So I don't want to switch the limits of integration. That would give me a third negative and keep it negative. I just want to have the double negative become a plus cosine of x between zero and pi over three. Now the third term does have a negative in it and it's a plus. So I want to get rid of that negative by switching the limits of integration. I'm big on switching limits of integration in case you can't tell. That makes it cosine of x between pi and pi over three. Whatever happens, I like to reduce the number of negatives to make it simpler. Okay. Now, the next thing that we want to take a look at is the last one. And again, on the last one, we have a double negative, which is going to make it plus. So because it's a double negative, we do not need to switch the limits of integration. So on the last one, I'm simply going to take care of it by doing the double negative. So I have plus one half cosine of u between two pi over three and two pi. All right. And now I'm ready to go ahead and substitute in on each one. Note that they're all slightly different. And because I switched the limits of integration, I cannot combine any of these. They all have to be done separately. All right. So doing the first one, I have one half times cosine of zero, which goes to one, minus the cosine of two pi over three, which is a minus a negative one half. So I have one minus a negative a half, which gives me three halves. Notice that I like to go ahead and take care of all of one at the same time, follow it all the way to its final form rather than do one at a time. It just works better for me if I can focus on one at a time. But then I'm ADD, so maybe that's just me, all right? I'm like off the charts ADD. Didn't get diagnosed till I was an adult, but um, I'm in the top 7%, woohoo, uh, who knew? It's just that I like schoolwork, so it never showed up, right? So my parents didn't worry because I like doing schoolwork. So it wasn't a problem in school. It's just that if they wanted me to stop reading, I never wanted to stop, right? I was terrible. I couldn't stop what I was doing. Okay, so now we've got plus cosine of X from zero to pi over three. So now I'm gonna do that part. You guys check my trigonometry and my arithmetic. So I've got cosine of pi over three minus cosine of zero. Cosine of zero goes to one. Cosine of pi over three is one half minus one, which becomes a minus one half. So I can write this as two fourths to get a common denominator with the three fourths, right? Now I wanna do the third one cosine of x between pi and pi over three. So I have plus cosine of pi over three minus cosine of pi. 
cosine of pi over three is one half minus cosine of pi is a negative one. So that gives me a double negative, which makes it one half plus two halves or one, which is three halves. And I could write three halves as plus six over four, all right? So that's three halves or six over four. <clears throat> And now I'm finally to the last one that we did with u substitution. So I have plus one half the cosine of two pi minus the cosine of two pi over three. Now, this is gonna give me a one half on the outside. Cosine of two pi is zero minus cosine of two pi over three is a negative one half. So that gives me a double negative, which makes it a positive. One half times one half gives me one fourth. Isn't it cosine of two pi one? Oh, gosh, yes. Thank you. I'm thinking sine. Boy, <laughs> if you weren't here today, I'd be in a world of hurt. Okay, yes. One plus one half would give us three halves. So one half times three halves, is that right? Cosine of two pi is one. Cosine yeah. of two pi over three is a negative a half. That's a double negative, three halves. So that gives us plus three fours. Okay. I really underestimated how much space I needed. I've got, I'm getting 10 fourths. Is that what you guys are getting? Yep. That is not what I got the first time. Hmm. Did I make a mistake somewhere? I did, I have a mistake in my notes, ha. Okay, so our solution is in fact correct. Let's start one from total scratch. Let's see which one we might wanna do. Um, all right, let's do, yeah, let's do example five, okay? All right, we want to find the area of the region bounded by the curves given by the x-axis, x squared minus 4x and 2x minus eight. It did not give us a closed bounded region, which must mean that their area they're talking about is completely contained. It must be trapped between these curves. And we have three, one was written in words, but it is nonetheless one of our boundary curves, the x-axis, x squared minus four x and two x minus eight. So the first thing to do is graph. All right. So we're gonna graph the x-axis, y equals zero. Then we're gonna, why is that there? Quit. Okay. Um, it was at x squared minus eight. What was it? X squared minus four x. Ah. Okay. X squared minus four x. And then what was the last one? Two x minus eight. All right, here's our regions. All right, so we're gonna take a picture of this. All right, so here's my region. I'm gonna blow it up. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my hot pink and I'm gonna outline the boundary markers. So I have the x-axis, which is here, x squared minus four x, which is this parabola, and the line two x minus eight. Now I have a problem and what's my problem? 
below the x-axis? Um, it's below the x-axis. It would be a problem if I were looking for net area, but I'm looking for total area. So it'll still work out. So I won't have to worry about that being an issue. So it's not because it's below the x-axis. So that can make it a little more tricky. Brittany, I saw you hold up two fingers. Yeah, there's two different areas. There's two different areas that are completely contained. I have one larger region here and I have a smaller region here. So the question is, is it both or is it only one? And if it's only one, which one is it? So now we go back to the words and the words say, find the area of the region bounded by the curves given by the X axis, X squared minus four X and two X minus eight. This is sometimes ambiguous. I try to write the questions so that it is not ambiguous, but sometimes it is ambiguous. You could argue that this smaller region does touch the x-axis right here at four zero. But I think that what the authors of this question intended, which is not entirely clear, is they intended for you to find the area of this region because it has clear boundaries of the x-axis right here along the top, the parabola here along the left side, and the line here along the right side. Okay. Now, the difficulty on this one is that we have to divide the region up because what's on top, while it's always the x-axis, the function that's on the bottom varies. First, it's the parabola up until it intersects with the line, and then it's the line that's on the bottom. So I need to know where the line and the parabola intersect. So I'm gonna look at the line and the parabola, and I'm gonna set these equal to each other, and I am not going to divide by X, even if I have that opportunity. So I'm gonna move everything to the left. And then I'm going to factor, oops, getting ahead of myself. So I have X equal four and X equal two, but based on the graph, this is the first intersection point to the left. So the one that I'm interested in is this one right here, which is at two negative four. In other words, I want to split the region here at X equal two. So I'm going to integrate from zero to two, where the parabola intersects the X axis at X equals zero. And I'm going to integrate the X axis, which is Y equals Z, or Yes, y equals zero, zero minus, and then the parabola on the bottom, which is x squared minus four x. Make sure the whole thing goes in parentheses or you won't have the correct sign on it, dx, plus the integral from two to four of what's on top the x-axis, which is y equals zero, so you have zero for the function, minus the line on the bottom. And again, you have to put the line in brackets so that you get the signs correct. Could we also do just find the, the definite integral of the parabola from zero to four, and then find the difference between the top, like the line and the parabola? From two yes, to four. you could. Yes, you could. Excellent one. So one question was, could he just find the area between the x-axis and the entire parabola from zero to four, and then subtract from that the area trapped between the line and the parabola from two to four? And the answer is yes, you can. It will give the same area. All right. So you can do it either way. And both methods should end up giving you the same value. So we could also set it up to do this. 
the integral from zero to four of zero minus, then we have the parabola, x squared minus four x dx minus the area between two and four of the line over the parabola. So that would be two x minus eight minus the parabola, which is x squared minus four x dx. So that's the method that Juan suggested that we use, which is just the entire parabola between the parabola and the x-axis, and then subtract from it the small sliver between the line and the parabola. It can be done either way, all right? Both methods will work, okay? So let's take a moment and we'll work this one out. I'm trying to leave enough space so that I can see it. Um, Juan, do you work the method you were doing? And I'll mark the method I was doing and we'll see if we get the right solution. Okay. Get the same solution, we should. All right, so I have the integral from zero to two. Oh, I'm sorry, I already started with yours. <laughs> oh, you already started with mine? Okay, fine, I'll do yeah. No worries, you take that one on the right and I'll do the one on the left. So this would give me negative x squared plus four x dx minus the integral from two to four times negative x squared dx. Eight. And I'm going to rewrite the second one to get rid of some of those negatives by distributing the negative through. This should work. <laughs> it's always a challenge. Does it actually work? Okay, so now that I have distributed the negative and gotten rid of them, I am ready to go ahead and integrate. So I'm going to integrate the first term, which I have negative x squared, so it becomes negative x cubed over three plus the four x squared over two, evaluated between zero and four. Then we add to that another x cubed over three, minus six x squared over two, plus eight x, which should all be evaluated from two to four. Now we can go ahead and plug in. I find it easier to pull the common factor out. So that gives us negative one third, four cubed minus zero cubed. And then of course, four over two is going to become a two. I'm gonna finish the first term because I find it easier to focus on one at a time. So I get negative one third of 64 or negative 64 thirds. The second term, the four over two reduces to two. So I get four squared minus zero squared, which of course is 16. Then two times 16 gives me 32. Looking at the next part, I've got another one third times four cubed, but this time minus two cubed, and that's going to give me one third of 64 minus eight. 64 minus eight is 56, so that gives me 56 thirds for that term. Completing the fourth term, six over two reduces to three, so I have four squared minus two squared which is negative three times 16 minus four, which turns out to be negative three times 12, which actually is 36. So we should probably replace that with a negative 36. The last term becomes eight times four minus two. And <laughs> I'm replacing the 36 before I forget about it. And then 
4 minus 2 is 2, so we get 8 times 2, which is 16. Now we have some common denominators here. We have a negative 64 thirds and 56 thirds. So we can combine those two together, and that will give us some evaluations. We can also, of negative 8 thirds, we can combine the constant whole numbers to give us 12. And this gives us 36 thirds minus 8 thirds, which is 28 thirds. And that is the correct answer. Now that we've solved it the way that Juan suggested doing it, and we got a result of 28 thirds, let's go back and do it the way I had originally set it up, which is actually the way Juan ended up working it. So let's verify Juan's answer. So I've made a copy of the picture with the integral written on the side. So again, this method that I thought about first was to divide the region into two and to find the area of the left half by integrating where zero, the x-axis is the upper function and the parabola x squared minus four x is the lower function, but integrating from zero to two where the intersection of the line and the parabola occurs. So that gives us the integral from zero to two of zero minus the quantity x squared minus four x. And then finding the area of the second region, which is actually triangular. So duh, I didn't even think about this, but we could just use geometry, couldn't we? We could just take the area of the triangle, one half the base times the height, and get the area of that part. So we'll do it both ways just to verify. But again, what I thought of doing was taking again the x-axis, y equals zero is the upper function, and the line 2x minus eight is the lower function. And then integrating from the intersection point here at two negative four, and integrating from x equal two to x equal four, which is where the line crosses the x-axis. So we're gonna set this up and we're gonna solve this integral. And then we'll verify that this second integral in fact gives us the area of that triangle. So pulling it all together, all the things that we've learned in chapter five, I can distribute the negative to get negative x squared plus four x dx. And then on the second integral, I can distribute the negative as well to have the integral from two to four of negative two X plus eight. Now, the next thing we want to do is go ahead and find the antiderivative function. So we integrate each term. Remember when you do this, you can only integrate terms. If you have factors, it's gonna have to be U substitution or some other kind of formula. We only find antiderivatives for terms. So the antiderivative for negative x squared is negative x cubed divided by three. Then the antiderivative for four x is four x squared divided by two, evaluated from zero to two. Then we have the next term, which is going to have the antiderivative of negative two x is negative two x squared, add one to the power, divide by the new power, divided by two. And then we have eight, the antiderivative is eight X, and this is being evaluated from two to four. And then we're gonna go ahead and substitute in the limits of integration. This is fundamental theorem of calculus part two. And so this gives us negative one third times two cubed minus zero cubed, which this gives me eight. So this gives me a negative eight thirds. The next term, four divided by two reduces to two. And then I have two squared minus zero squared, which becomes four times two, which is eight. The next term, I have a two divided by two, which cancels, but it is negative. So I'm gonna leave the negative on the outside and I'm gonna do four squared minus two squared, which gives me 16 minus four or 12. So this is going to give me a minus 12. The last term is 8x, 
And when I substitute in, leaving the eight as a factor outside, I get four minus two, which is two. Two times eight gives me 16. And then I can combine my terms. Uh, 16 minus 12 is four. Four plus eight is 12. So I get 12 minus eight thirds, which is 36 thirds minus eight thirds, which is again, as you can see, 28 thirds. So regardless of which way we do it, we'll get exactly the same result. Now there's one more example I wanna work for you, and that's example number six. Looking at example six, we have an interesting function. This is y equal x to the two thirds and g of x equal four. g of x equal four is just a horizontal line at height four, as you see marked here in green. The curve x to the two thirds power is symmetric with respect to the y axis. Hopefully you can see that from the picture. What is it about the function that makes it symmetric with respect to the y axis? Well, x to the two thirds power is the same thing as the cube root of x quantity squared. When you square something, of course, whether it was positive or negative, you lose the sign, it becomes strictly positive. That is what creates this y-axis symmetry, the square. So on this particular one, we can see that it is definitely intersecting down here and intersecting here, but we need to be absolutely sure that we have the right values. You can't tell from a graph the difference between say, let's see, it looks like about eight. You can't tell the difference between eight and 8.1 or 7.9. So algebraically, you need to find where these intersect. So the first thing we're gonna do is find the points of intersection with our curves. So we want to find when X to the two thirds power is equal to four. Remember that we can think of this as the cube root of X squared or the cube root of x squared, whichever way you wanna do it, you can do whichever one first. So the first thing that I would do would probably be to raise both sides of the equation to the third power to get rid of the cube root. So whichever form you wanna write it in, and I would probably stick with the rational exponent form, and I would cube both sides of the equation. Now squaring sides of an equation is risky because you lose the sign, whether it's positive or negative, they both come out positive. But raising to a third power is not risky, it's an odd number, so it preserves the sign of whatever it originally was. So this is not something risky to do, and this will lead us to x squared is equal to 64. Then we can take the square root of both sides, we are putting in the square root, which means that we have to put in a plus or minus the square root of 64, which is plus or minus eight, which does correspond with what we thought it looked like. This is negative eight, four, and this is eight, four. So we have a choice now of how we wanna integrate. We could integrate from negative eight to eight with the line, four on top and the curve x to the two thirds on the bottom. We could also, because it is a y-axis symmetric region, we could also integrate from negative eight to zero and double it. Or we could integrate from zero to eight and double that. That would probably be the easiest of all three integrals. So we're going to take that tack and we're going to integrate from zero to eight and double the value because it is a y-axis symmetric region. Looking at the region that we are looking at here, we are finding the area of this yellow space right here, and then we're going to double it. And when we double it, we'll get the area between the green curve and the blue curve. Green is above, so that's y equal four. So we'll take four minus the blue curve on the bottom is x to the two thirds. So we'll have four minus x to the two thirds. 
our differential is going to be dx because I used x in here. But remember that the variable that we use in a definite integral is a dummy variable. It won't be there at the end. We're going to get a constant, which represents the area. Now we can take each of these individual terms and we can integrate. The two is a factor on the entire thing. So open large brackets and then integrate each term. Four becomes four X, X to the negative two thirds. We're going to add one in the form of three thirds. And then we're gonna divide by the new power, which is five thirds. Normally we would have a plus C, but we're choosing the constant to be zero. And we're going to integrate from zero to eight. The two is doubling the area so that it's actually from negative eight to eight. Now, when we write out the rest of this, the next thing that we're going to have is we can distribute the two if we want. And this gives us eight X. And then we can bring up the five thirds by multiplying by the reciprocal three fifths X to the five thirds evaluated between zero and eight. I'm gonna leave the eight on the outside and substitute the limits of integration, eight minus zero. The second set of factors coefficient is six fifths, which I'm gonna leave on the outside. And then I'm going to take eight to the five thirds power minus zero to the five thirds power. Remember that zero to any non-zero power is zero. Zero to the zero, remember, is an indeterminate form. So we get for this one, eight times eight, which is 64. And on the second part, we have eight to the five thirds. Now, remember that the thirds represents the cube root. So we can actually write this as the cube root of eight being written and raised to the fifth power. So the denominator of the rational exponent represents a root and the numerator is a power like it normally is. Now the cube root of eight is, happens to be two. So this gives us 64 minus six fifths times two to the fifth. Two to the fifth is 32. So we have 64 minus six fifths times 32. I would probably use some kind of handheld calculator to come up with the solution for this, or you can do it by hand by getting a common denominator. The common denominator, of course, is going to be five. So this would give you 320 fifths, 64 times five over five. And then six times 32, would turn out to be a 12, carry my one, 192 over five. So 320 minus 192 comes out to be 128 over five. This is the last example I wanted to work for you on how to find the area between two curves with respect to X. The one thing that we have not done today is we haven't done an example of one with respect to Y. So that's the one example that we have not done yet, finding it with respect to Y. The process is the same, but you have to solve the equation for X so that your expression has Y in it. And then you integrate from the lowest Y value C to the highest Y value D. Instead of left to right, it's lower to upper. And so it looks a little bit different on the graph. I was hoping I would have a picture right here. So when you're looking at this one, see how the strips go horizontally? So the differential here is going to be dy. And then you do the rightmost minus the leftmost when you're doing the function. Instead of upper minus lower, it's rightmost minus leftmost. 